Welcome everyone to this lecture on landscapes fashioned by water. Several interrelated topics will be covered, including physical or mechanical uh, weathering, chemical weathering, mass wasting, the hydrologic cycle, the work of running water and alluvial features, the occurrence of groundwater, the components of a groundwater system, and environmental problems associated with groundwater. So there are a variety of topics in this chapter, but they are all interrelated. The learning ob objectives I will leave to you to go through. I don't want to take up the recording time by going through every one of them, but you need to. So let's look at this idea that the earth is dynamic. We should know this by now. There's always something going on. It, it's never static. Um, the earth is powered. Everything that happens on earth is powered by two different engines. One is an internal heat engine and the other is an external heat engine. The internal heat engine is responsible for elevating the land and the internal heat engine is powered by the decay of radioactive elements. There are other things involved like the fact that earth has gravity and there's this pulling inward, gravity works to pull things toward the center of the earth and that generates heat. And there's also residual heat left over from all those accretions that took place that formed earth to begin with. But by far, it's the fact that we still have radioactive elements um, that power plate tectonics that elevate the land and we'll get into some of that in, in the next few chapters. Then things that we've already covered, weather. Weather is powered by the external heat engine and the external heat engine, of course, is the sun. The sun provides all the power for all the weather that takes place on earth and weather will cause weathering of rocks. So there are several external processes that we're gonna discuss in this chapter, weathering being one, mass wasting and erosion. Weathering, there's physical weathering, and I, you, I'll use that interchangeably with mechanical weathering. They both refer to the same process and chemical breakdown of rocks at or near the Earth's surface. Then there's mass wasting. Mass wasting is a type of weathering, but it gets its own category because the major power behind mass wasting is gravity that force that pulls everything toward the center of the earth. Then erosion. Erosion is the physical removal of weathered particles by a moving agent like wind, water, and glacial ice. By far, running water is the major, uh, the major force that moves material. Let's first look at physical slash mechanical weathering. This is the process where rocks are broken down into smaller pieces. The rock doesn't change in any way. It's the same. If it's sandstone that's being weathered, then we just get smaller pieces of sandstone. And the sediments, these different sizes, are classified according to their size. Going from largest to smallest, they're boulders, cobbles, pebbles, sand, silt, clay. And for detrital or clastic sedimentary rocks, if you've been looking at chapter two, I think it is, um, looking at rock types, you'll see that in sedimentary rocks, they, the clastic sedimentary rocks are named based on the particle sizes. So for example, if it's sand sized particles that have been uh, cemented together, then the rock is sandstone. If they're silt sized particles, then the rock is siltstone. Uh, boulder scobbles pebbles, it depends on whether they are angular or whether they are more rounded as to the, the name that we give the rock. So the rock composition is unchanged. It just gets smaller through these various processes that can be enhanced by the presence of joints in rocks. Joints are these fractures in rocks and in some places, joints are just weaknesses in the rock, but they have a regular pattern to them depending on the particular rock type. And the presence of these joints, they're 
really weak areas in the rocks. So that's where Mother Nature is going to concentrate her power. And over time, these uh, these um, hidden weaknesses will become visible as these fractures in rocks. So the types of physical or mechanical weathering include frost wedging, unloading, or sheeting is another word for that. Just make sure you know how to spell that. And biological activity. Frost wedging happens because we at temperatures where the uh, at prevailing temperatures where there's freezing and the temperatures drop below freezing and the temperatures get above freezing freeze thaw action freeze thaw action so if there's any water that water is going to freeze and water has this very unique characteristic of expanding when it freezes so you can kind of work out over time as you get these weak areas in the rock and water heads to those weak areas and it freezes, then it thaws. If freezes, then it thaws. It's gonna expand those weaknesses. Uh, so we end up with these cracks or joints in the rocks that are gonna then be really places where water can hang out. So uh, some basalts, which is an igneous rock that we have a lot of here in California, will produce a really unique uh, form from freeze-thaw action, uh, action or from uh, frost wedging called columnar weathering or columnar jointing. So this is what happens. This is a rock and you can see it's been split down the middle and the, what has caused that is freeze-thaw action. Water has expanded those weak areas in the rock and over time it splits apart. That's in the Smoky Mountains in Tennessee. And this is what I was talking about with columnar jointing. Look at these perfect columns here. You can see the shapes by the talus pile at, at the bottom of it. Uh, this is um, basalt rock. And again, when basalt, basalt is a, an igneous rock that forms from the solidification of uh, magma or lava, I should say. And when it freezes or when it crystallizes, it has this unique pattern to these weak areas. They're kind of polygonal uh, in shape, polygonal in shape. Uh, and that's where um, freeze thaw action is concentrated. So you get these unique columnar features. Then this is just another talus pile. That's T-A-L-U-S from the weathering of this rock cliff here. Then there's unloading and exfoliation. That can occur and is very common in a rock like granite. Granite forms underground under extremely high pressure. So when, once it makes it up to the surface through either weathering and erosion or tectonic uplift, it expands and it expands along those weak areas that are just inherent in that particular type of rock. So these layers will begin to split away from the main, uh, from the main body of the granite. So the rock will break apart in slabs and it tends to create these domes as these layers like an onion peel away. We call those exfoliation domes because the, the rock is actually exfoliating. And some examples would be Stone Mountain in Georgia, Half Dome in Yosemite, El Capitan in Yosemite. And this is um, Stone Mountain in Georgia. Uh, if you've ever flown into the Atlanta airport, you've probably flown over this. You might have looked out the window and you see just mile after mile of piney woods and then here's this stone mountain. Hmm, I guess that's how it got its name. Stone mountain that's poking up out of this, these piney woods. Uh, that was a granite pluton at one time. Uh, and you can see how it's got this nice rounded shape to it now. And again, that's a result of exfoliation. There's another view of it. And then here's Half Dome in Yosemite. And here is a close-up of Half Dome. And you can see these layers. That one, and, and we don't know when they're going to break away. That's why this can be dangerous climbing for those people that are into that kind of thing. 
And so once that layer peels away, then that reduces the pressure on the layer below it, and it will kind of expand along these weak areas, and then it will peel away. So you see these little layers all the way through here. So exfoliation domes. Then biological activity is also a type of physical uh, weathering. Plant roots are really good at breaking rocks apart. It's just amazing how much power a plant root exerts as it grows. Then we have human activity that can also result in the physical weathering of rock, construction practices, exposing more rock to the elements so that it can um, uh, be broken into smaller pieces, and burrowing organisms like earthworms, really good at displacing rocks, exposing more of a surface area to the elements to be physically weathered. And this is an example. Here's a, look how that tree has just grown up right through that rock and just, it's amazing the power. Here and here. So a lot of people think, well, how can a tree grow through rocks? Well, remember rocks are composed of minerals. So the tree extracts the minerals from uh, the rocks and gets the nutrients that it needs to continue to grow. And then this shows earthworms. Earthworms move a lot of, of soil and rocks can be displaced as a result of um, you know, losing their support because the soil is being moved around. And um, again, more surface area exposed to the elements. Here's another tree growing up through granite. Look at that. And then there's lichen and algae that can grow on rocks. It can, this can do uh, physical weathering as well as chemical weathering because sometimes it produces, the stuff will produce an acid that will do more chemical weathering. But again, it can help to um, expose more surface area. Then chemical weathering. The minerals in the rocks are chemically altered. So remember with physical weathering, nothing changes chemically about the rock. It's just it gets smaller. But with chemical weathering, we're actually altering the minerals in some way. They get added, they get changed, or they get removed through these chemical reactions. And some of the more common ones are oxidation, dissolution, and hydrolysis. So the first one we'll talk about is oxidation. Oxygen, of course, is common in air. It's common in water. Um, so the minerals will react with oxygen in the air or in water. And one of the more common um, types of physical, or sorry, chemical weathering that we have is rust. Anytime you see a red rock or red soil, it's rusted. It's where iron has uh, combined with oxygen to give us FeO2, iron oxide, better known as rust. These are the red rocks uh, outside of Denver, Colorado. Um, it's the iron in these rocks that have been exposed to oxygen. That's why they're red. Remember Mars, the red planet? It's how we know that there used to be oxygen in the atmosphere on Mars because all of the sediments, all the rocks are, are red. This is uh, another view of red rocks. This also happens to be a, a concert venue uh, in, in those red rocks. Um, back during the Depression, the Civilian Conservation Corps built this um, uh, musical uh, venue out of these rocks. Here's the, these are the seats right here. The stage is down here. And you see these rocks are tilted up, not quite vertically, but these were sandstones that were just, you know, not bothering anything until the Rocky Mountains started moving up under them. The Rocky Mountains started growing, so it tilted those sandstones up. So in the west, these are called flat irons. Sometimes you'll hear them referred to as hogbacks. I guess that comes from the pioneers who were coming out in covered wagons, and they would see these things in the distance, and to them, 
it looked like you know, a hog's rump uh, just laying out in the field somewhere. Here's another view of it. All oh, this beautiful sandstone here. Here's the seats that people uh, sit in and the stage. They're looking out toward Denver. So if you're out here at a concert at night, off in the distance, you see the, the beautiful lights of Denver. Then rocks um, can decompose also uh, because, again, exposure to oxygen. Uh, which, when it's dissolved in water, will be way more reactive. But then, if there's acid involved, then that really increases the, the chemical weathering capacity of substances. So, uh, carbon dioxide, we've got, we know that we have carbon dioxide in our atmosphere. So, rain, when it forms, actually has a pH of seven, but as it falls through the atmosphere, the water, H2O, reacts with CO2, and it gives us a weak acid called carbonic acid. So that carbonic acid then will, will um, play a, a role in dissolving things, and it, the, the acidity will actually increase as it moves through the soil with all the organic material in the soil, then the pH actually will, will drop even more. Uh, so if you remember your pH scale, it goes from 0 to 14 with 7 being neutral and anything less than 7 is considered to be acidic and anything higher than 7 is considered to be basic. So the pH naturally of rain that reaches the surface of the earth is about 5.4. Well, that is less than seven, so it's slightly acidic rain. And what will that do? Well, dissolution is what occurs. Minerals will dissolve. Uh, we know this, think of salt. Put a spoonful of salt in water and it dissolves right away. So this rain then, as it moves through the atmosphere and then picks up um, more acidity, as it moves through the soil, will begin to react with things like sodium, potassium, and carbon, and especially calcium carbonate or limestone. So dissolution will give us caves. Limestone is a rock that is composed of CaCO3, calcium carbonate, or calcite. So the acid water dissolves away the calcite, leaving these holes behind uh, because the limestone, again, has this really unique jointing pattern. It's almost rectangular joints, very angular. The water follows those jointing patterns and eventually will dissolve away um, the, the calcite and we end up with caves or caverns. Then as it moves into other areas, as it moves along, it can become super saturated with this calcite, so the water isn't capable of holding the calcite in solution anymore. So as it drops off the roofs or on the floor of caves, drop by drop by drop, that calcite will precipitate out. And that's why we get these very unique cave features like stalactites. That would be the ones growing from the top of the cave. And then stalagmites are the ones that grow up from the floor of the cave. We'll talk more about that when we get into groundwater at the end of this chapter. So let's talk about mass wasting. Mass wasting is the downslope movement of rock soil, rock soil debris under the influence of gravity. Gravity is the main force involved in mass wasting. Remember, Newton explained gravity as the attractive force that exists between any two bodies that have mass. So things are tugged toward the center of the Earth. We call gravity the go force. It will pull rocks, it will pull mountains down. Well, if gravity is the go force and we can't get away from gravity, gravity is gonna be with us. So why aren't all things falling down around us? 
And the reason for that is because there are resisting forces. Resisting forces in rocks, resisting forces in mountains, resisting forces in, in road cuts. The resisting forces all depend on what type of rock it is, how uh, cohesive the material is. So these are resisting forces. So we've got gravity as the go force, but there's internal shear strength in material. And again, it will be different depending on what material we're talking about. But that internal shear strength is a result of how cohesive the particles are, how well they hold together, and friction. So we have a stay force that is the opposing force of gravity. The go force, when it overcomes the resisting forces of the material, then things will move, things will be pulled down slope. And there are factors that might favor one force over the other. And some of those forces uh, would include, um, or some of those things that might overcome those forces would, in, would include something like saturation of the soil with water. The, the, the particles then get pushed apart by all the, the water in the soil. So all rocks and soil material have what's called their own angle of repose. The angle of repose is the steepest angle at which a material is stable. If they get steepened beyond that angle of repose, they move. So if we pick something like gravel, those are odd shapes. Um, they would have an angle of repose of about 40 degrees. At that angle, the gravity and resisting forces are in balance with each other. If we lessen that slope, then the stay force would be greater than the go force. If we increase that angle, then the go force would be greater than the stay force and the material would move. Again, that is just an average angle of repose. The angle of repose will differ depending on what sort of material we're talking about. So gravity is the controlling force, but it can be triggered by, as I stated before, saturation of the material by water over steep slopes, like the example before, and then removal of vegetation. Roots can provide resisting forces, uh, but we get vegetation that gets removed by construction, we get vegetation that gets removed by logging, we get vegetation that gets removed by forest fires, which we have a lot of here in California. And then another way that the stay force can be overcome is by ground vibration. And again, that could be heavy equipment, that could be sound, uh, and here in California, that could certainly be those as well as earthquakes. Well, there are categories of mass wasting, and there are many ways that we could divide these up. Um, I don't want to get into the weeds too much with this, so I'm gonna simplify it. There are falls, like a rock fall, there are flows, and a type of flow is soliflexion that is uh, found in Arctic and Alpine tundra areas where the ground is frozen, where moisture in the ground is frozen. Uh, there's permafrost underneath. Uh, permafrost is just permanently frozen soil moisture. Lahars uh, are a type of flow. They're volcanic mud flows. Then we have debris flows. Uh, then there are slides, like landslides. Uh, then there's soil creep, which is the slowest form of mass wasting. Now these are basically uh, defined by what type of material it is and the amount of moisture in the material. Um, so again, it's a little bit subjective as to, okay, is it a landslide? Is it a mud flow? Well, if there's more water in it and there's this flow characteristic to the movement of the material, then we would call it an earth flow or a mud flow. Let's look at some examples of each of these. This is a rock fall. Uh, this is the old man of the mountain in New Hampshire which was a national park and 
one of the iconic images associated with New Hampshire. If you know anything about state quarters and you look at the 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 things that in individual states voted on for what they wanted represented on their quarter, uh, you'll see that New Hampshire had Old Man of the Mountain. That's how iconic it was. Uh, it's granite. And you can see all of the, the jointing patterns here. Look at all the joints. So here's the feature, that very prominent nose, very prominent chin here. And the people at the Park Service knew that it was getting ready to fall. So they had done everything. They had cables trying to keep the face up. But then on May 3rd in 2003, that's what happened to the face. It kind of got a shave. No more prominent chin, no more prominent nose. So certainly not that nice feature right there. So those are rock falls that occur. Fast, instantaneous. Uh, where you have roads that are built in steep mountain, steep Rocky Mountain areas. This is in Zion National Park in, in Utah. This is in British Columbia, these rock falls that have come down on roads. And then this is um, something that you would not want to do, and that is build your house under an unstable cliff. Beautiful house. I don't know why they chose to build it here because look at these boulders that are in the yard. So they had to know that there were rocks that were falling from this cliff. This is a perfect scenario for disaster because you have very hard sandstone at the top and see this thin bed below it. That's shale, S-H-A-L-E, which is a weaker rock than sandstone, so these weaker layers are going to be weathering away. Well, what happens to the strong rock above when the weak layer underneath it has been weathered away? It's going to start breaking apart and falling, and that's exactly what happened. Um, more boulders fell into this, into the area below. The house was just, I uh, can't can't talk. The house was destroyed and the two people living inside it were killed. Uh, so pay attention to things like that when you decide that you're going to buy some real estate. Then this is a rock fall mm, a couple years ago in Yosemite and you see all the granite here. Um, this was on El Capitan uh, that killed one climber. Well, what can we do? Well, in areas where we have motorists underneath these unstable rocks, you, there's a type of, of screening that's used. Um, it's draped over these unstable rocks to keep falling rocks from the motorists below. I call it chicken wire. It's certainly not chicken wire. It has to meet a certain strength. It's be, it, it will stretch and it has to be capable of catching boulders of a certain size moving at a certain speed. And then this would be a slide. This is in um, California, around the Klamath River, steep terrain, unstable rocks. Uh, we'll learn in, in, the, in the plate tectonics chapter why this is so rotten, why the coast range is so rotten. The rocks are uh, very um, uh, unstable. They weather very easily. You throw the steepness in there and you have a recipe for disaster. Then this is a mudslide slump. I, hear, I see it in the literature called everything. Uh, let's just call it a mudslide or a mud flow uh, in uh, La Conchita, California. La Conchita is this tiny little community north of Santa Barbara that is in an area like this. So there's the, the look of it. And you can see, again, this is coast range. So these rocks aren't held together well at all. This actually is a marine terrace up, up here. This used to be a beach, but because California has a tectonically active coast, we have that, that marine, that beach that is now a marine terrace. So this is where the new beach is forming. But look at this little community. It is caught between this very unstable mountain and the ocean. There's Highway 101 here. There's also a railroad track here. Uh, but you can just look at, look at all these gullies that have been carved into this stuff. 
So you know that there's danger here, or you should know that there's danger here, but these people love it. Uh, it's been a community for a long time, but in everybody knew it was slide prone, but they still continue to live there. There was a slide in 1995 that destroyed some homes, but didn't kill anybody. But then there was another one that happened in January of 2005. That one killed 14 people and wiped out about 49 homes. And there's the, there's a view of it. There it is, look how far it came out. I'm sorry, I misspoke, killed 10 people and destroyed about 49 homes. So here is the highway. There's a railroad there. But there's danger behind these, these folks. There's another view of it. There's a road there that was taken out. And here was a retaining wall. Let me get my pen going here. Here was a retaining wall right here. See that? There's a retaining wall. See what the retaining wall did to prevent the slide? Nothing. There is one of the homes that was destroyed. So these, I remember when this happened, and I remember it was a particularly wet January. They had received lots of rain in this area, as we did also here in, in the Sacramento area. And this unstable material got super saturated and it just fell. And I remember Arnold Schwarzenegger uh, went down there to express his sympathy for the people that had lost their homes and the people that the families of people that um, their loved ones had been lost. And he said, we're going to make sure this doesn't happen again. And when I heard that, I just thought, how in the world are you going to do that? How would you make this place safe? You would have to take down, if you started cutting into this stuff, that just makes it worse because the support for anything above is lost. So it's kind of a nightmare scenario. Well, the other thing to look at here is, and what is this up here? See all this vegetation up here? This is actually an avocado farm. And these folks that lost homes or lost loved ones, they sued the rancher up here because they said he had contributed to the fact that this moved. And they also sued the county that had built the retaining wall because they said the retaining wall hadn't been built properly. So they sued and the, they, actually, the, they actually won part of their lawsuit in that the rancher up here was held partly responsible for the damages. The, their um, accusation was that um, he had used improper irrigation practices and that had helped to saturate the soil. Um, then for the county, they said that the, the county had improperly built the retaining wall. So the court ruled that yes, the rancher was responsible, so he had to he couldn't come up with the mon all the money for all the damages, so he handed over this property along with, I think, about $5 million to the, to the plaintiffs in the case. Um, the county, though, was um, not held responsible because the court said that they had given sufficient warnings to advise any reasonable person to stay away from La Conchita, so the county wasn't responsible. There are currently about 300 residents that live here. Nothing has changed. They weren't even able to remove this debris because they thought that any, any movement in here would bring other stuff crashing down. And there's nothing that has been done to try to stabilize any of it. So they have like a neighborhood watch keeping an eye on all this. Uh, if anybody sees water coming down in areas where it shouldn't or any type of movement, then they warn their neighbors. So not a good way to live, but um, they do it anyway. This is from an area a little bit south of La Conchita. This is a mud flow that happened 
uh, again in a particularly rainy uh, uh, January in um, what 20 a couple couple of three years ago it was right after the Thomas fire where all this area had been scorched um, again the the plants had been removed the vegetation had been removed in the forest fire so then all this rain came and there was this mud flow the only difference here in Montecito is that it's a very wealthy area so they got together and there's there are plans to build a big basin to contain any of, of the material that comes down in the future so again it just shows you the difference between the wealthy and the the folks that aren't as wealthy uh, the the total unfairness of it all and i put this link in here so you can look at some of the uh, pictures associated with the montecito mud flow um, montecito is a very wealthy area it's where people like oprah live um, uh, what's his name? Rub Lowe lives there. Um, who else? The Big Lebowski guy, the guy that played in the Big Lebowski. Jeff Bridges lives there. In fact, his home was destroyed by the mud flow. He had to get rescued by a helicopter. Then there's the Oso Washington slide, too. That destroyed a community and killed 43 people. This, again, is an area where there should never have been a community built there to begin with because it's volcanic soil which volcanoes are just rotten that's the materials loosely held together it's an area that was heavily logged so the the support of the tree roots have been uh, have been removed time after time uh, and it had slid in the past so people knew that it it was a very dangerous place to live in uh, so 43 people were killed, a road was blocked, a river was dammed, and again, this is an area where the county had tried to get involved and built retaining walls, but like the first year that a retaining wall was built, a, a smaller slide took it out. So people knew of the danger here, but they still continue to live in it, in this area, because it's a beautiful spot. This is also Washington. Um, this is a, a landslide and you see this house sitting here used to be up here. So no solid rock in here, unconsolidated soil material, get it wet, um, it's going to move and even if it's not wet uh, because it's unconsolidated it can move at any time. Then this, I hate to talk about all this death and destruction, but we need to be aware of these things. This was a mud flow, uh, the result of a volcanic eruption in Colombia in South America. The name of the volcano was uh, Nevado del Ruiz, I think, and um, there was a pyroclastic flow associated with it. That pyroclastic flow melted the glaciers and the snowpack at the top of the mountain. So there was a, a lahar, a volcanic mud flow, 30 feet deep, moved into the town. It was at night, the people had no warning, and 20,000 people were buried in, uh, in this horrible, horrible event. The ironic thing was that there was a geology report sitting in an office somewhere that recounted what the danger was uh, and they had given no warning to the people at all. Then there's soliflexion. Soliflexion again is in these areas of uh, Arctic and Alpine where the moisture is permanently frozen, have a short summer, but in that short summer what happens is the top part of the soil will begin to thaw out. Then the bottom part here, this is where the ice is here, so it's almost like a glide plane and like a water slide here. So the ground then will move down. Uh, so it's like a seasonal flow. Uh, and some of the things that you will see with that, well, first let's look at what permafrost looks like. That's called a pingo. 
I like that word, pingo. Uh, but this is ice, permanently frozen moisture. We've got a problem with this anyway, global warming causing this to melt. All sorts of disasters are happening in these permafrost underlying areas. But this is what I'm talking about, this flow. Well, this is okay because there's nobody living here. So you get these lobes that are seasonally um, displaced down these slopes. And then this is what happens when you build. You should take certain precautions when you're building on permafrost. This is a house that's the foundation was built right on top of the permafrost and heat from the house melted the permafrost. So the house is now uninhabitable because it has, it's all cattywampus here from subsiding. There's a railroad track that has been um, deformed by the melting of the permafrost. And then the Alaska pipeline is built over permafrost, but they took precautions. They knew that the heat from the oil moving underground would melt the permafrost. So sections of the, of the, of the pipeline are built above ground. And at these sections right here, we talked about, I think I'm, sorry, it wasn't you all that I mentioned earthquakes with. We haven't done earthquakes yet. It was another class. Um, these are built in sections like this uh, instead of like one rigid pipeline. Uh, and these sections are on like these Teflon skids. So if the earth moves, then these sections move with it. If it was just one rigid pipeline, then if it was shaken, it would break. Then these are debris slides. All these are in California, coastal area, no solid rock here. Um, waves pounding at the bottom. So the, the base of the, of the cliff is worn away. Well, what happens to anything above? It's going to fall. This is in the, the, the uh, San Gabriel Mountains here. And then there's creep. Creep is the small, uh, is the, the, the slowest form of mass wasting, which is why it's called creep. All these bends in the trees here are a result of very slowly all this material being dragged down to a lower elevation as a result of gravity tugging it downward. Other things that you see are terracets. Cows in areas where you have um, you know, farmland or people have cows, they walk along the contour of the hill and over time they have little paths that, that form and then those little paths will slowly be dragged downward. Other things that you see as a result of soil creep, retaining walls that are bent outward like that. If you're building retaining wall, you have to make sure, even if it's level ground, you have to make sure that you build it properly. You want to get all the water from behind, so there should be drainage holes in here to dewater the material behind. All right, so I'm going to pause for uh, this section and we'll talk about Earth's water reservoirs next. So see you next time.